Well, hello, everybody. This is a very special episode of World War II TV because it's an easy one for me because I'm dropping out in about 10 seconds because I'm handing over to a, a new host for tonight, Olivia Smith, who's going to uh, adjudicate this uh, group of amazing historians I've got for you. I'm very proud to bring them to you, an eclectic mix of talent. So I'm going to drop out and hand over to Olivia and we'll talk about being a historian. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over right now to Olivia. Thanks, Paul. So, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. This is really exciting to do this with these phenomenal historians. Um, some people I have admired in the field myself, so I'm really excited to hear what they're all going to say tonight. Um, the bios are on the YouTube description below. Uh, obviously, you can go find out more about these incredible women, but I think we all hit, want to know what they're going to say in these topics. So I really want to kick us off with, for each and every one of us, we've all had a defining moment, I think, that's made us interested and pursued a career in the Second World War and military history. And I think we'd, I'd love to know from all of you, because you have such a bright, well, wide range of backgrounds, what really was that defining moment? Uh, Sarah, could you kick us off? Yes. I'd be happy to start it off. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Kirksey. I am calling in from New Orleans. Thank you to Paul for inviting me and Olivia. Uh, but for me, I, I think what got me started into World War II, it was uh, when I was just a really uh, young little girl. I, uh, I'm one of four, but I have an older brother and a little brother. And I always spent so much time at the ballpark. And so my mom would take me to the library to check out as many books as I wanted to read. And I'd be this be a little four-eyed kind of nerdy little girl reading these books at the ballpark. And I just, um, I read a book about the Holocaust at a very young age. And that was it. I became very uh, fascinated with these stories and, and the survivors and how um, you know humans could do these things to, to other uh, humans. And that's what really got me started into World War II history. I stayed interested in it all of my life. Um, after graduating uh, from Louisiana State University with my bachelor's, I really honestly did want to go back to school and go get my master's in history. Uh, but I enjoyed college a little bit more than the average person. So I felt like it was time for me to grow up. Um, I started working for the World War II Museum in New Orleans in 2015. And having the, the wonderful colleagues and the support system that I did in both my family and at the museum, I was encouraged to go back. So I did go back and uh, get my master's degree uh, with a focus uh, on the Holocaust. And then one other uh, wonderful moment was I, I met this Holocaust survivor, Hannah Corral. She's from Łódź, uh, Poland. She uh, lived in LA. Uh, I was introduced to her and, and she totally changed the course of my life. She encouraged me to go study in Poland to work over there. And um, so yeah, those three defining moments. My mother taking me to the library, working at the World War II Museum and also Hannah Corral. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, next up, well, Melissa, what about you? I didn't hear that. Please try that again. Melissa, you're on mute. I don't know if you can, we can't hear you, Melissa, if you can hear us. Whilst, quickly, or I'll shuffle on to someone else. Jenny, would you mind telling yeah. Melissa back? Hello, Jenny, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, Jenny. Um, Hadrian's Wall and, and castles in Wales and so forth. Um, so the progression uh, to do in history at university was, was fairly natural. Um, I was particularly interested in 18th century um, and my master's is actually on sort of Anglo-Russian um, diplomacy. Um, and then I veered into teaching rather than continuing into academia. Um, so I've been more of a, a generalist for, for the past few years. Um, the thing that made me pursue a career in Second World War history was the annual trip to Ypres, the battlefields trip that, that we all do. Um, and I was reading up on uh, the history of the city and discovered that it had been liberated by the Poles in 1944. Um, I'm from a Polish background. My mother's parents um, were deported to Siberia. Uh, they were attached to the Anders army. My grandfather fought in Monte Cassino. Um, but so my grandmother's got, you know, bookshelves full of Polish history written by Poles and um, published, printed in Britain, but it wasn't more generally known. And the fact that I didn't know about magic exhibition was appalling. So I began to read more broadly. Um, we started with sort of Emma McGilvray's book, which was my sort of gateway drug. Um, and then just generally um, sort of pursued this idea of how just 
the, the breadth of the contribution of the Polish armed forces just isn't appreciated in Britain, even by um, sort of unique pockets of the Polish community. Um, and that kind of sort of drove me to then sort of translate Maciek and share that on Twitter. Um, because again, on, on I think it's got better, uh, but again, the, the Polish presence on English Twitter hasn't been that significant. So that was kind of how I got into it. And then I, I sort of discovered my sort of passion really of wanting to actually take this to PhD level. Um, so that's where I've come from. It was, it was a school trip to Ypres. Oh, that's brilliant. I think definitely those school trips are such signifying moments in like that's sparking the interest for everyone. Uh, Melissa, have we got your... Can you hear me? Back? Yes, we can. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, I had to switch cameras. <laughs> so I'm coming to you from Lincoln, Nebraska, smack in the middle of the United States. And thank you, Paul and everybody for um, doing this. My defining moment, it was, I've always been interested in history. And what got me started in World War II and interest was watching the movie Memphis Bell. Um, I don't know if you remember that. It's from the 90s and it had Harry Connick Jr. in it. And I kind of got in, um, interested that way. But it wasn't until I went to graduate school and I was originally going to do uh, Women of the American and French Revolution. And then I took a course in Nazi Germany and it was a very intensive course. We did a book a week. We read a book a week and then we would discuss it in class and write a book review. And I was just like, OK, I'm done. This is this is what I want to do. So, um, and I also, you know, my, my great uncles were in the war, so I loved talking to them um, when they would talk about it. So it was, it was kind of a, you know, a combination of a lot of things, but it's been my passion ever since. Oh, that's lovely. Um, Alina? Hi guys, thanks for inviting me. Um, so basically I was that weird 14 year old kid in the corner. Uh, that would read history books and books on the Holocaust. And I got really interested in that. But um, I've kind of grown up with the uh, massive Polish influence, as very well everyone knows. <laughs> Polish. My great grandfather was General Władysław Langner, who was the general in charge of the defense of Lwów. So I grew up with that. I grew up with my grandfather, who was uh, in the Warsaw Uprising. Again, my Twitter is filled with all the uprising kind of stuff. But the downside of all of this, I was really severely bullied at school where people told me I was too stupid, I'm a dumb blonde, I'm never gonna amount to anything. So for a really, really long time, I pretty much believed people that it was true. And then eventually in my mid twenties, someone said to me, look, you love history, you're really good at it, go study at university. So I went to evening classes and uh, worked full time, studied full time, got my degree decided to go on to my master's. And that is where I met my supervisor, Nicholas Wachschman, who to this day, I don't know if he's listening, but to this day, I thank him every day. Uh, he's the one that pushed me towards working more into the concentration camps, which is something, you know, as all historians can say, we love our subject. Um, and I really do enjoy it. So thank you, Nick, for giving me that little push into where I am now. I hope if any of those bullies are listening, they can see how amazing you're doing right now. And this is such a kick in the teeth to them because keep going, you're doing incredible. Like, Thank you. Yeah, incredible. Jo? Um, right, hello everybody. First of all, thank you to Paul for really hosting this. You've brought um, Second World War into everybody's life through doing this. How I got to um, be a uh, second and actually First World War historian was um, through my dad. Uh, my dad served in the Second World War and he had three daughters. And both of my sisters are, are way um, older than me. And so when I was born, my mother went to the doctors and went, uh, I think I've got a gallstone and the doctor went well I'm very sorry Mrs Hart but you've got a new daughter um, or a new or a baby on the way and um, I entered the world and uh, I think my dad for him it was his last chance saloon um, so I was brought up with um, all those films that you saw in the 70s, The Battle of Britain, Bridge Too Far, uh, The Dam Busters, and I went to bed with stories of what 
my dad did in the Second World War, what my mum did. Um, she lived through the Blitz in London and then went through school, as you do. Um, I lived in Hong Kong and worked with um, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission as part of my job in the military in Hong Kong was, was identifying relatives who came out to Hong Kong to, to look at uh, relatives. And then, um, you know, I sort of like thought, this is what I want to do through my life. Came back to England, um, joined the Territorial Army and everywhere I moved, I um, arranged a battlefield tour with a specific company. And that company eventually, when I moved to Germany, I lived in Germany, said to me, Joe, um, we want you to um, guide tours and doing Operation Market Garden for groups that, um, for military groups, are all interested in market garden from Germany so that's what I did started off there uh, moved on and this is 16 17 18 years ago I don't, can't remember how long ago um, then also covered the first world war as well and so um, today I work for six seven different battlefield tour operators I'm a historian battlefield tour guide um uh, yeah, out on the battlefields. Unfortunately, today uh, I can't do my job because of this horrendous pandemic. But that's that's where I came from. That was a remarkable career, Joe. And I know you'll be back on the battlefields as soon as possible. I hope so. I you hope will. So. You will. Everyone will. We all will be returning. Yeah. Um, Stacy. Uh, yeah. Hi. Aloha, everybody. I'm coming to you from Hawaii. <laughs> uh, so it's bright and early, eight, eight in the morning. Um, thank you, Paul, uh, for putting this together. Um, yeah, so I actually did not decide to be a historian. Um, I was a software engineer, and there are these tax credits for IP industries in Hawaii, and um, so software was one of them. And then at the last minute, they tacked on film. And so I, I don't know if people are aware, but the 100th Infantry Battalion 442nd Regimental Combat Team is an all Japanese American unit that is the most highly decorated unit in US military history. And it started in Hawaii and there would be no 442 without Hawaii. And, um, and so, you know, as a kid, you know, growing up in Hawaii, you kind of take it for granted. And so my dad would tell me stuff like, oh, uh, uncle Ko, you know, my great uncle, he was in the 100th Battalion. He was defending Hawaii on Pearl Harbor Day uh, from the Japanese, and he's a hero. And I'd be like, ah, I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm nine. I'm a girl. It's ancient history. Uh, and so that, that's, <laughs> so I didn't really, there was no defining moment. <laughs> um, but when these tax credits came about, I thought, well, you know what? What should be a movie is the story of the 100th 442. And that's when I started on this journey. Um, and I, I went to the vet. So in Hawaii, the veterans clubs are very active. And so this is like 20 years ago that I started. Um, and I would just go to their clubhouse and hang out and became really, they became really dear friends, you know, like very close, like family. And, and that's really what what got me started, um, just listening to their stories. And I thought, wow, this is so amazing. And it's crazy that most of America does not know, you know, this story that we take for granted in Hawaii. I mean, we're, we're where it all began for the United States, Harbor, there's Arizona Memorial. Um, thousands of people come to visit, you know, specifically to, to pay their respects at, at the USS Arizona Memorial. Oh. So. That's so interesting. Shamely, I don't really know much about it myself. Can you, the film, is it available to stream? Can we all watch it? So where can yeah. we watch it from? Um, so it's on goforrogemovie.com. Uh, there's a link to the Vimeo link. Um, Brilliant. And actually, so that's where I met Paul in Normandy. So the film won outstanding feature film at the World War II Normandy. Fantastic. So I think everyone really needs to give that a watch after this then. Fill up your Monday night. 
And finally, I believe Claire. Hello. Hello. Thank you, everyone. Delighted to uh, to meet you all um, and to be invited to take part. So I was always very interested in history. Um, love reading books. I just love stories. History is a lot of stories. Um, but I moved towards military history, I suppose, in two ways. One is um, I studied politics and modern history as part of my first degree. And during that, I looked at some Polish history. We looked at Katyn, which is something one day I will write about myself. Um, and so that brought me very much into Second World War history. Um, but then I did social and cultural history for my master's and kind of moved away from it. But then I was... Uh, looking for a second book subject and I was looking at some of the female special agents and I read a book called Carve, Carve Her Name with Pride which is the biography of Violette Zabo and this book kicks off its introduction I've actually got it here it says this is the story of a girl and then later it says she was indeed simple herself devoid of affectations and completely without guile but uh, with a gradual deepening of her sense of purpose beneath her outward airiness and frivolity, uh, she developed instincts of which she'd been utterly unaware. It's almost like this girl was unaware of her ability to do this amazing uh, war role that she took on. Um, and I just thought, surely someone like this deserves a better, a better look. So I became interested and I wrote my second book about Christina Skarbek, who was the first woman to serve Britain as a special agent in the Second World War, um, a Polish born woman. Um, and there is this, I think there's this really rich theme of untold women's stories, uh, particularly in war history or history of conflict. Um, and when they are told, I think they are being told slightly more now, and there have been some fantastic books recently. Um, but I think often you still see them uh, talked about in quite romantic terms. You know, we often hear about how beautiful these women were or, um, you know, how very courageous and some of them, some of them did pay with their lives and paid the ultimate sacrifice. And we need to, of course, remember and honour that. But I think we're much less good at talking about these women's effectiveness and their achievements so I thought there was something new to be brought to this um, and even in terms of evidence you know during my research I found um, papers so I wrote about a Nazi female test pilot and her family's papers she was part of the she married into the von Stappenberg family and they're all in military archives but her papers were sent back to the family and filed under domestic so they haven't been used, they're not part of the historical record. Or um, a lot of the female agents that I was talking about, you know, when they were given honours, they were given civilian honours because as women they weren't entitled to military honours. And so that seems to have placed them outside a lot of military research. You know, things like that really make a difference. So I suppose I was brought in by seeing, seeing the real gap, seeing that there is this seam of history that could be much better told. I think that's so important and I think the fact that there's a gap there is such a shame but you're doing such incredible work to make sure that that gap is filled really good um so following on from that really girls um I wanted to ask like for you what defines a military historian um Jenny this is something we briefly talked about together and I wonder if you could kick us off with this um, yeah, I, I volunteered to talk about it and then I've spent the past week sort of debating it and kicking it about um because, I mean, obviously, you know, military history has evolved from your, your classic traditional um, study of, of battles and campaigns um, to become deeper to look at the sort of economic and the cultural political underpinnings of, of a military effort. Um, at the same time, you had these sort of uh, diversification that we're looking at, the increasing role of women and the civilian experience. Um, so military history, I mean, books are written literally called What is Military History? Uh, with chapters entitled Is Naval History Military History? Um, just to kick it off. Um, so I'm actually at the stage of not quite knowing. I can define traditional military history. I really love that, um, I don't know if this was Paul or Olivia, that this show really neatly sidesteps this and labels it World War II historian. And I think I'm much happier going with that label. Um, even though my, my research very much touches on the, the more technical um, aspects, um, it certainly brings in the social and cultural side as well. So my contribution is, I'm not quite sure. Oh, I mean, that's a cliffhanger to leave us on, isn't it? <laughs> but it is, like you say, it's so broadly covered. I mean, anyone else, I think, I'd love, Sarah, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I, I never, ever, ever claim to be a military historian. And um, I... No matter how many times I say that to some of my guests or people that I meet, 
uh, both you know through my career or just uh, you know out and about, somebody always wants to challenge me and start asking me about a very specific unit or a gun or this tank versus that tank. And I, I just, you know, smile and go along with it. But I remind, I remind them, I am not a military historian, but I work with some of the best military historians, I think, you know, that there are. So I'll introduce you to them. Now, if you want to ask me questions about the Holocaust, I'll, I'll talk to you about that all day long. But um, I, I think that uh, kind of what Jenny was just saying, I love that this is more listed as a World War II historian, and it's not just military, but it can be social or cultural. Um, and it, it's really neat seeing how this particular, uh, this field and the study has really a range of, of different people and what they like to study and what they can contribute. Um, and, and I know that um, one of the questions that you did have, Olivia, before I turn it over to somebody else is just about the stereotypes of, you know, being a military historian or a World War II historian. And I probably the biggest one that I ever deal with is that I don't know what it is about me. I don't know if it's because um, I wear colors like pink or because of my Southern accent, uh, but I make terrible first impressions. And people always think this girl does not have a brain. And so, you know, I usually start off with um, really dealing with people that think I'm an idiot, but then usually by the end of the tour, I've, I've convinced them that I do in fact have a brain. So I guess it's better to start off um, them thinking I'm an idiot and, and ending with thinking I am smart uh, instead of the other way around. But um, that is a couple things that I, I, you know, deal with as uh, when you fall under the World War II historian label. Well, Sarah, I can say as first impressions go, that's not mine at all. So don't you worry. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not an issue. Uh, Elena, what do you think on this topic? Well, I think everyone's pretty much answered mine. <laughs> um, would, well, I was going to say, would you say there's any stereotypes in the field? Yeah, people usually think, oh, don't you do it with like guns and military stuff? I don't, I don't have a clue, like... <laughs> Don't don't ask me about anything to guns or, you know, sometimes I have an opinion, but don't even bother asking me. I have no idea. I deal with the people. I deal with their experiences. I deal with everyday things. You know, what was the weather like? That kind of really simplistic, boring things that people think that are boring, but they're not actually that boring. But um, yeah, I think that's more or less a stereotype that people think military historian. And um, like Sarah, I've had uh, a couple of people that are like, oh, but you do military history. Well, no, I don't. I'm, I deal with predominantly concentration camps. Um, the, you, you could kind of twist that in a way. I don't know. I don't know if Sarah wants to jump in here a little bit where, you know, people do try and twist that and say, oh, well, it was a bit military. You know, you had this and that. And yeah, I think that's going to be my contribution there. Oh, that's great. Sarah, did you want to chip in there? Or can I move on to... No, uh, I agree with you 100% that that is the case. Um, it, it, I guess it could be kind of, um, but what is, it's all intertwined. It's, it's definitely a part of the same war. Uh, but again, I, I don't want to ever claim to know something that I don't. What I like to do is be around people uh, that, are, that are smarter than me, that know more than me so I can learn from them, but then also uh, connect people. To, you know, you want to hear more about Normandy and, and the, the landings of D-Day, well then let me introduce you to Paul Woodage or Pierre Samuel or Cristal or Sylvain. I know these guys and they're the ones that I want, I want to tell you these stories. It's not me. And I'm okay yeah. with saying I don't know something. <laughs> Claire, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, um, well, I, I kind of agree with all of you. By the way, Alina, I think the weather can be very important in military history. And uh, and Sarah, I completely agree it is all part of the same war. But also, I think we can all learn from each other. We don't all have to know everything. But um, yes, I suppose I think it's all too easy to, I mean, in some ways it's useful to try and delineate and have categories and try and narrow down a field. But I think it's important that we all sort of cross section. I think you were talking about some of the um, stereotypes or whatever, I suppose. I think of history, military history, as being the history of armed conflict and its impact on people, places, and so on. Um, and I think the stereotype is of a, a big canvas book written by Anthony Beaver or Max Hastings or someone, which does the day to day go through the military campaign, um, which of course is incredibly valuable. Um, but I think we can also do military history that drills deep and into one section and doesn't look at everything. Um, 
And I think, you know, I mean, that's the thing where I talk about Beaver and uh, Max Hastings. I did a little Google search before knowing that we were doing this um, panel um, to, and I just put military historians in. And in the first 50 names that came up, there were only five women. But, you know, I can roll off many more than five women working in this field who I think are fantastic, you know, kicking off with Margaret Macmillan, who's one of my heroes. But there's so many of them. And the men were all, um, well, Beaver Hastings, uh, Richard Evans, Richard Overy. I came to Richard Overy and actually thought, well, is that, is that the closest, is his second name the closest I'm going to get to a woman in this list, you know, Mr. Overy. But um, in fact, there are so many of these women like Halit Kachansky from Poland or Lublia Vinogravada from, uh, from Russia, Joanna Bork, Juliet Pattinson, Beatrix Hilzer. There are so many of them. So I think one of the stereotypes is that it's not written all of it by men. And it's important that we all bring our own insights to that bigger tapestry, that bigger picture. It's yeah, such a good point to mention there, Claire, really is. Thank you. And I think it's shocking. Five women in a list of 50. Yeah. Well. But hopefully that will change. change. It. it will change. And that's the whole point of tonight and moving forward and exposing the fact that so many women are in this field. <coughs> um, so I would like to move on. And I think we're going to go through in this and to look at what each woman's experience is individually, because the women we have here tonight have such a wide range of experiences within the Second World War. And I'd like to kick start with Jenny, because you've both been involved in both teaching and academia um, side of the Second World War historian. You know, could you enlighten us a bit on your experiences there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and do cut me off because I mean, I, I've kind of got two, two jobs at the time. I, I really don't want to make this the Jenny Grant um, show. So um, on the one hand, I've been teaching for about 15 years. Um, I teach secondary, I teach girls. And that's fabulous. Um, I think our, my main contribution to this or, or our purpose as history teachers is to encourage historical thinking, appreciation of the diversity of the past, um, a, a respect for other perspectives. Um, and we try to expose um, children to, you know, the sheer scope of possibility of historical research. So we do cultural history and social history and diplomatic history. Um, we do military history, our year sevens right now are prepping the classic Battle of Hastings essay, and it's all very sweet. Um, we're a little bit more hamstrung once it gets to exam boards, um, for example. I, they exist, but, you know, um, so the options for, for pursuing military history um, once you get to exam level um, are, are more reduced. Um, but I think what my school does in particular, we've got this tradition of bringing in historians and speakers. We, we had Claire two years ago, which was fabulous. Um, so people absolutely at the top of the game talking about um, their experience, their passion and so forth. But what I'm really trying to do and um, since I've taken over uh, the department is bringing in early career historians. Because one of the things that I never was exposed to um, due to sort of social background the school that I went to and so forth was how you actually get there um, because as a child from the northwest comprehensive to it's not enough just to see a female role model um, that can just be as intimidating as a male and um, because there's all the class differences and there's, there's race and so <coughs> forth interacts with that so what I'm bringing in is early career historians who explain to our students how the world works. So what are the sacrifices and challenges of pursuing, yes, your passion, um, which carries you a long way, but financially, how you secure funding um, and aspects of sort of, we talk about sort of growth mentality in education of being open to new experiences and not having to know that you know it all yet and, and have that sort of perfection streak that can be so damaging. Um, so we have them talking about, you know, how, um, we had Dr. Adam Chapman talking about um, how he needed to learn Welsh, for example, or the, the need to pick up language skills. So it's this openness, I think, to new experiences. So I don't want to bludgeon them to death with military history. Um, I mean, I quite like to, um, but I want to make it much broader and to make it possible to actually pursue a passion because I think students aren't real risk takers at that age and, and that's understandable. And it may be that this isn't a path they pursue immediately, um, but I've got plenty of friends, I'm sure everybody else has, who pursue second careers or, or, or further interest later in life. Um, so in terms of the academia, um, I feel a little bit of a fraud. I'm literally two weeks into a PhD programme. Um, my experience has been perhaps um, unusual. I'm not sure. I've had absolutely nothing but support. Um, I've actually, I found Twitter and social media incredibly helpful for actually making connections 
and I've been utterly shameless in appealing for help from leading historians, which again is something I perhaps wouldn't have had the confidence um, or the skills to do when I was in my early 20s. Um, and they've been absolutely wonderful. I had my supervisor um, meeting today, um, and I honestly don't think gender has come into it, but I know from following um, historians like Jill Sargent Russell, for example, uh, the frustration of the military issuing women only reading lists or panels on your area of expertise that include only men, for example. Um, so I don't want to give an unnecessarily rosy um, I, sort of picture. I think there is a lot of confidence and worldly wiseness wisdom, wiseness, um, that comes with being that bit older, and that I think has sort of carried me through some of the challenges that might affect younger women, um, and I'll acknowledge that freely, but I would say ask me back in a few years and then we'll see exactly, um, I might have a more realistic picture of women in academia, if that's okay. Yeah, that's so interesting. Jenny, you kind of make me really wish that you were my school teacher, because you sound so inspirational, like just so encouraging I feel like that's something I really wish I had a bit more guidance and understanding how to get to a certain place in the career because I think that's definitely not what's taught in schools now so it's brilliant to know that you're kind of helping those young people and forward in their careers like that. Um, I just want to follow on with Melissa because Melissa you work within like publishing and a different side of academia to what Jenny does and obviously you're in the US so it'd be really yes. interesting you know there's a comparison to your experience there how do you find it? Um, I actually have been uh, just like her, um, I've actually had a lot of support and I, I plan on starting my PhD next fall because they're not taking any new ones due to the pandemic this year. Um, and, but I went to school and, and I'm in my forties, so I'm doing this later in life, but I also feel more confident in, you know, pursuing this now. And I'm really excited to get going on it and I've just had you know tremendous support from you know my former advisor my grad school advisor when I got my master's degree so um I do think that um on the publishing side of things I have two books published um both of them are local history um I focus on Nebraska the first one was on um the POW camps here in Nebraska during the war and it was a topic that not very many people knew about so I was really surprised at how well the book was received. And um, my second book is on just the state of Nebraska um, as a whole during World War II. And I think it speaks to, there's several, as you probably know, there's several different publishers in the United States. And the one that I went with focuses on local publishing and regional. And I think that's something that the major publishers tend to um, not really, you know, get involved with. And so there's a big, I think there's a big need for that. A lot of people want to read about stories about their state or their town, you know, what happened during the war then. And I've also published a, um, quite a few articles um, about the home front. And that, I did those in a magazine called American World War II. And that really focused on the American home front. And that's a lot of magazines that focus on World War II history tend to be on the, you know, very heavily into the battles and the military leaders. And so I really, with my interest in the American home front, I really wanted to push stories um, out there that, you know, don't have to do with military battles and leaders. And I really think there, there's um, a big a disparity there that I would love to see more on, um, you know, academic publishers. I, I'm an editorial assistant for two academic journals, and it's kind of, we try and reach a general audience, but we also, you know, specialize for academics as well, and there's definitely two worlds there. You know, you use specific language in academia, and, you know, there's always that issue of, or is this understandable by anybody outside of this field? And I think that's really important to, um, to me, especially is to, you know, I want to reach a general audience and that's what I write. I, I want to tell the stories. Um, and so my experience in publishing has been, you know, really good. I've, I've been encouraged a lot and I, you know, can't wait to do more. Um, I'd love to turn my eventual PhD thesis or dissertation, which is way, way down the road <laughs> into a book someday. Um, so, and I don't know, you know, how well um, publishing works on the other side uh, in Europe and, and the UK, but um, I think 
um, there's there's lots of great things happening there. I think it's fair to say that when your PhD does get put into a book, we'll all be the first ones to be reading that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you have a fan base here at the Ready. Yes. <laughs> um, Stacey, I believe you want, we want to talk about your comic book. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I um, before I made the movie, I wrote a comic book. And so this is Journey of Heroes. And so this guy behind me is actually a friend. He's a, they're all real veterans. This is Eddie Yamasaki. And Eddie helped me work on the movie for 15 years before he passed away in 2017. But so this is this is what I did um, for the story of 100 Battalion 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And so, you know, touching on Melissa's point, you know, you wanted to reach a general audience. And so that's that's what I wanted to do. And that's why I published the comic book. So here in Hawaii, um, even though, you know, we, we take it for granted that the 100 or 42nd, there are friends, our neighbors, there are, you know, grandpa, our uncle next door. Um, but, you know, the generation that's being born and being, you know, they'll, they'll never meet the veterans because they're passing away. So that's why I wrote the book and we self-published it. Um, the 442nd Foundation helped me. Um, and there's a letter from, you know, Danny, no Senator Danny Noe, he's a Medal of Honor recipient in there. Um, but it's, it's a historically accurate comic book. And I wrote it for, um, for younger kids, you know, like seventh, eighth graders. But I found that it's being taught in university levels. And it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of cool. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's got a life of its own. I mean, the prime minister of Japan has two copies that were presented by veterans to him. Um, and, uh, President Obama signed it. So there's a picture of him awarding them the Congressional Gold Medal in the book as well. So it's, uh, oh, and um, Caroline Kennedy, when she was ambassador to Japan for the United States, um, I left her a copy as well. So, <laughs> so it's really a, a pretty cool journey with a comic book. You know, it's, it's just a little hum humble comic book, but it's really like the Cliff Notes. So um, that's just one way uh, to reach people, you know, the popular audience, make it. I, yeah, I think that is so important, Stacey, because everyone finds a way to be interested in history through different means, whether it's a book or a comic book or TV and film. So whatever popular method is, like you say, it's very important to kickstart the engagement and the interest in the history. Right. It's like the gateway drug to yeah. literacy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I just want to touch, so moving on to the next subject, um, and I kind of want to know your opinions on, you know, the back to the diversity really in military history. It's something we've kind of touched upon, um, you know, like where your school background is, your geographic kind of location as well. Uh, Claire, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, well, just I think how important it is that we have that diversity of perspective in, in all, it's vital in all fields of history, not just military history, of course, but uh, across the board, because, you know, history isn't, isn't just the past or it's, it's not just a window onto the past where we kind of open it look through and there is the truth laid out for us history uh, certainly books that we write uh, the text that we write is also a mirror reflecting back our own preoccupations right what we've brought to it our own perspectives so if we want to have as rich a view as possible it's very important that we have uh, historians looking from as many diverse perspectives as possible so that we pull out I mean that's why we have all sorts of different books on the same episodes. We have uh, a feminist book, or perhaps there's been communist histories, or there's been whatever. Um, and, and I suppose even every generation wants their own take on things. They bring a different perspective. I mean, that's why we have so many books revisiting Elizabeth I or Joan of Arc, because everyone kind of wants her to reflect the values of their day or to make it relevant to them. So I, I do think it's vitally important that we avoid stereotypes and we have as much diversity as possible. And that's not just gender, it's all sorts of different perspectives. Um, and it's partly so nice seeing uh, women representing Poland, America, Hawaii, all these different voices here today as well. Oh, it's so important. Oh, moving on to one of our American girls, Sarah, what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, I'm, I'm from the Deep South. And so, you know, growing up, uh, pursuing a career in history was really never an option. It, 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 it just was nothing that was ever discussed. I could be a, a nurse or um, I could be a teacher um, or definitely a mother. That's, I think, probably what most people in the South, um, they tell us women to do and be. Um, but as I got older though, and, and once I went to grad school and also working through with the National World War II Museum, I was introduced to quite 
um, a diverse group of, um, of women and men, uh, people of color. And, and it's just so interesting to see uh, this, this broader range that I didn't know and see growing up. Uh, when I was in grad school, you know, seminars, there's only like nine, 10 of us, um, half of us were women. And um, several of them uh, were pursuing a career in some kind of military uh, history. One was on the Civil War, one was, uh, she was working with Japanese internment uh, and focusing more on the Pacific. And I loved it. I, I felt, uh, I guess part of me felt validated um, and then encouraged and um, also just through with my job though and the women that I have traveled with um, there's there's battlefield guides that I've been able to work with, but also people like Dr. Alexandra Ritchie. She was, uh, I met her at uh, an international conference here in New Orleans, um, but she was also someone that wrote a recommendation for me to come and study in Warsaw, and she became a mentor and a friend, and um, she's always the one that has encouraged me to never let other people get me down. Uh, but focus on the good and keep on doing what I'm doing. Um, but then also look at social media and look at what Paul is doing, bringing all of this women together. And it's um, uh, it's so neat being able to connect with people that maybe I'll never will meet in person, uh, but I'm going to learn from you and, 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 and you can learn from me and we're gonna just keep on pushing forward and uh, educating people and, and being a part of something really great. Uh, so I, I think I have a really, a, a great experience um, working with different people of different backgrounds. That sounds actually quite positive, and I, Sarah. It's nice to hear. Definitely, uh, Jenny. I know we've touched upon this, so I know you've got some really good thoughts on this this particular topic too. Yeah, I, I really liked what Sarah was saying about the role of mentors. So, um, just um, I have a five year old, and she's a complete force of nature. Um, torn between being sort of tank commander or a fire officer. Um, and there's a little kid at school and she wants to play football. Uh, she's the only girl that wants to play football. Um, we're in a fairly traditional area here. Um, and this boy won't let her play football, this little alpha male five-year-old, so like chief tadpole or something. Um, so she goes and plays on the monkey bars because you can't play a team game if people don't let you in. Um, and we've taught her not to snatch, which I think would be a fine reaction. And we've taught her to not to, you know, to, to hit out. And um, so she's off there playing the monkey bars. And I think if we stretch that to, you know, women in military history, um, that football being withheld represents a huge amount of, of lack of privilege and opportunities. Um, so it's, you know, it's, are you neurodiverse? Are you somebody whose parents didn't have the time or the um, money or the education to take you to these places? Um, have you not had a mentor? Um, are you somebody, you know, the CCF, for example, at, at public schools is a way, clear way into an interest in military that, that isn't represented in girls' schools or in state schools, for example. Um, are we, you know, privileged from our, our family backgrounds? Have we got connections? Did a grandfather or great-grandfather sort of share his stories with the girls as well as the boys, for example? Um, not necessarily that the boys or the girls weren't showing the interest or whatever. Um, so I think for a community that prides itself on analysing causes analytically, um, we're not very good at actually appreciating the, the privilege that has actually got us to this stage. And I think if we're wanting a diversity, it's, it's all very well saying, yes, we want to hear these voices, but we need to actually address that practically. And we need to be reaching out to the schools and to the, the kids who are younger, because that's where the sort of um, the grounding and enthusiasm begins. Um, so that's my soapbox, Olivia. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's so interesting, Jenny. Thank you for highlighting that. Um, I'd like now to kind of move on and I'd like to just talk about like were there any changes that you made in your career to say fit in because me and Paul spoke about this when we were talking about this would would men kind of think that there are certain things they don't change I know for myself that I actually will change where I live because I live on the borderline of two counties so depending on who I'm speaking to I might say I'm from Norfolk because I just think it sounds a bit nicer I don't know why I just always kind of feel like that and I always try to suppress my Suffolk accent at times and bring out my Downton Abbey type instead but other people won't naturally have those thoughts and I just like to think Joe, is this something you've come across or you've kind of thought about it within your career? Um I've thought about it but to be honest um 
I come from a very diverse background. So um, I was born and brought up in Surrey, um, which uh, very commuter belt. Um, I, my ex-husband was a military man, so we moved uh, throughout Europe. Um, and then I settled back down in Norfolk. But to be honest, I, um, I'm a great believer in what you see is what you get. And um, so I've never changed the person I am. Um, this is me. I've got an MA in military history. I, I, I've, I, I've done my groundwork. Um, and f- certainly from a personal perspective, I and this is speaking from the heart now, it, it's like, if you don't like me, well, fine, fair enough. But I've done everything I possibly can to um, deliver uh, the best experience I can as a battlefield guide. And, you know, if you don't like what I do, well, fair enough. That, that, that's the way I look at things. I think that's quite a good way to think about it, Joe. I like that. <laughs> I think you need to take on myself, definitely. Uh, Leda, I know I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So I'm pretty much like Joe. I haven't changed myself for no one or nothing. However, I uh, grew up in Hackney. Uh, occasionally you can hear the Hackney accent come out, especially when a podcast. Um, Alex also brings that out in me. Yep, Alex, that's all your fault if you're listening. Um, my dad taught me how to speak RP from a young age, purposely because... As people very well know, people respond better to the RP accent in general. So my accent fluctuates without, you know, on purpose between RP and the East London. If I'm surrounded by East Londoners, forget it. Accent goes out the window and out comes the Hackney. But it doesn't bother me. If you don't like the way I speak, you don't have to listen to my podcast. You don't have to listen to the way I, to what I do, to how I speak. Jog on, basically, is my line. I love that. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. And good on you, rightfully so. Uh, Sarah, I know you want to input on this as well. It's, it's so funny that all of us have mentioned our accents, which I love listening to all of you, especially here in that UK or European accent. It, it's so nice. Um, but my accent has been something that I've, I've, I've had to really overcome and kind of change whenever I'm on the road. Uh, sometimes it's funny. I remember the first time I was at the Bastogne Barracks and Joel, I was, I was talking to him, uh, one of the guys that works there, and he interrupted me and he goes, where in the world are you from? And I said, oh, I live in New Orleans. I'm from the United States. And he said, no, no, that, that is not an American English accent. Um, and so I do have to sometimes uh, change the way I do talk a little bit but Paul and I were, were kind of tweeting back and forth the other day. So whenever I'm on the road and we do these tours, um, you know, the museum has its own international travel department and I'll go and I'll manage them. And I'm, you know, giving instructions and directions and telling them when they get back on the bus. Uh, but just this past fall, we, we come back from our Normandy and the Seine River cruise uh, trip. And, uh, you know, as, as the entire department and then, then several others were, were looking at the the surveys and this one person I don't know if it was a man or if it was a woman it was anonymous but uh, their review was great trip except I hated listening to Sarah I hate her voice and I just I, for, first of all I was humiliated I'm sitting there with all of my colleagues and this is something that is being read out loud uh, but also what was what was the point of writing that I can't change my voice. Um, I can maybe change my dialect a little bit, but but this is really just who I am and how I talk. Um, but I was embarrassed and and it also was angry because that kind of criticism that, that that's not even constructive. But also, would you ever say that about a man? Would you say that about Sir Anthony Beaver? Which I love listening to Sir Anthony Beaver. But I mean, if if he got up, would anybody ever write that review? I just hate listening to Sir Anthony Beaver's voice. No, I mean, that's just, I think that's one thing that we as women are having to constantly uh, deal with, this, this criticism that's not even constructive. 
Um, and I don't know if any of you have to deal with this, but also clothing. You know, I've, I've worked with some historians, male historians, that'll throw on a pair of sweatpants and go out into the battlefield and not think twice about it. But as a woman, you, you got to think about, okay, is this is this top too, too booby? Or is this, you know, dress too, too short or too fitted? Is it showing my figure too much? And it's, um, these are things that you do have to think about as a woman in this field. And maybe not even just this field, but as a woman in general. And those are a couple of the things that I'm constantly having to consider and think about, um, you know, in my day-to-day -day life. I think it's a really good point. It kind of reminds me of, um, I once got told by a guy that my Twitter profile picture didn't look too professional for a historian. So suggested I should change it. And I kind of thought, but that's just me. There was nothing really wrong with it. Like you say, there was, you think you have to reassess and what, how you have come across and how you dress and how you appear, but then men wouldn't at all. So why do we have to be so constantly aware of it? It's a really good point. Um, Claire, I know you've got to talk about race, which is obviously a very important topic as well to highlight here. I just thought that we can't have a conversation about diversity without at least sort of making some note that, you know, that there are many things. I mean, personally, I've never considered what I'm wearing, um, but I have been mansplained a lot and I have um, also had a very uh, a sexist um, article written about me on the mail, um, sorry, on the Telegraph online by a male historian because I wouldn't share my research with him and he knew, I suppose, that that was an easy way to get to me. So we, we, yeah, we do face all that. But I think there are plenty of other people that face a lot more. And I just think we should recognise also some of the other diverse voices um, that we haven't really touched on and, and sadly weren't able to join the panel, I guess. Um, but for example, just one example, uh, I've got a very good friend called Shravni Basu, who has done a fantastic book called For King in Another Country, which is about the Indian soldiers on the Western Front in the First World War. And I think that when, we, when we're thinking about diversity, as well as gender, we need to think of some of the other matrices that affect the way that our books are received, the way that publishers, you know, what they want us to publish and all the ways that we are sort of channeled in different directions. So I think that we need to think more broadly than gender as that intersects with other things as well. Definitely. And it's such, especially now the political climate, it's extremely point, good point to raise and be very aware of within this. Always field. important. Yeah, always important. Um, well, we touched on, Sarah, you touched upon like the guiding um, industry, and this is really for you and Joe, as you, I know you've both been involved in battlefield guiding. And I think it's fair to say that it is quite a very heavy male dominated field. And I'd like to know how you both feel working within that industry. Has that ever bothered you? Have you ever felt mansplained? I know, Sarah, you mentioned about your voice and stuff. That's obviously coming from people who are listening to you. But has that ever been something from your colleagues within the field? So can I... Um possibly uh join on this one yeah just um, direct to tj because it's um it, it's part and parcel of what i do i'm a military historian and a battlefield guide and i'm going to be totally honest in that i have never ever ever apart from one who was an australian guide um never had any detrimental um, feedback from any of my male um, colleagues in the business and I work predominantly I think Sarah will probably agree with me um, I work predominantly with men in this business because it's a very difficult business to get into if you're a female historian I think I'm the only one that does Operation Market Garden um, and um, I'll be totally honest with my peers, um, so the men who who um, actually go and guide the battlefields with me, I've never ever experienced um, any detrimental um, and adverse, uh, ex uh, um, you know, experiences or to me being a, a female military historian. Where I have um, experience that has been with um, male passengers. So I guide first and second world war. And um, quite often when I'm on the first world war battlefields, I'll pick up clients from Paris. They come in from Paris and, and, and because my name is, is a, a kind of like you could be a Joe or you could be a Joseph. 
So they, they immediately come in and I'll, I'll, I'll meet them at, at Charles de Gaulle or, or a hotel or whatever. Um, and they'll be like, oh, but you're a Joe. You're not a Joseph and you're a female. And I guide a lot of Australians. So on top of that is, oh, and you're a pom. Uh, so I get that. Um, where Market Garden's concerned, um, where I've had uh, uh, difficulty is been with generally men, um, not battlefield guides at all, um, but with, with um, the public in that um, military groups I've taken out to Market Garden and I've had some really sort of like detrimental, uh, uh, f not feedback, but when they've initially um, realised that there is a female guiding them, they'd be like, well, what do you know about our battlefield? Um, and what can you tell me as a female? And I've had that from 3rd Parachute Battalion Regiment. So um, Paul, I think, will agree with that. Um, but, but generally, um, I haven't had... Uh, a lot of difficulties uh, with men um, on the battlefield and certainly not with with my peers who guide. I'm, I'm great friends with men who guide on the battlefields and, and I realise that, that they recognise me as a female guide and I think they look at me as, okay, you're a female, but if you can hold your own, and you deliver what is expected to be delivered, i.e. really good, not duff history, then we'll respect you for that. Um, so I've never, ever experienced that with my male peers in the industry whatsoever. Um, and it, it sometimes irritates me, and I say that quite loosely, but it, it, it does irritate me that that um, there's this whole sort of like, um, you know, we are females on the battlefield guide and all men um, don't, don't get on with where we're coming from. Because I don't think that's generally true at all. Uh, the experience I've had with male guides is that they... Um, are willing to be friends with me. They're willing to support with support me as long as I deliver really good history. And that doesn't matter whether I'm male or female. Yeah, what I've... matters. What matters is that I deliver good history. I think that's the important thing here, Joe. You know, we you of course you deliver good history. It's why you're one of the panelists tonight. And you know, this is what we also wanted to highlight, the fact that you're saying you've not really had a bad experience. You know, we didn't want this to be a thing where we're talking about all the negative experiences. We mm. want to highlight that, you know, this is an inclusive and, you know, supportive industry as well. But unfortunately, along the path for some people, there are hiccups along the way that we have experienced as women. And I think, Sarah, have you touched upon some of that too? Yeah, you know, and again, whenever I'm on these tours, unless I'm really in Poland or it's it's dealing with something of... of the Holocaust, um, again, I'm, I'm going to give that mic and let my contracted guides do all the talking. Uh, and yes, I, I have had some experiences uh, with some of the older historians or sometimes a guest uh, that just doesn't want to listen to a woman or they don't want to hear what I have to say or they want to try to uh, um, challenge me in a way that... Um, you know, or if I, I can't answer, I can't deliver, it's like they want to prove that I'm not uh, worthy of being there. Uh, I remember one time, I mean, I've been doing these tours for three years now, but I remember this one particular historian who told me I just had finished with my master's degree. I'd just gotten back from Poland. And he said, well, you don't speak Polish, so your degree is useless. And I just couldn't believe that he just said that. Now, what I could do is sit there and think about those types man or woman 
that's going to tear me down. Or I can think about the friends and the colleagues, the wonderful guests that I've traveled with and I do know and have become dear friends with. That's who I want to focus on. I want to focus on uh, the people like my female mentors like Alex Ritchie or, or Karen Dixon Buick. Um, who I traveled with for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Or I want to talk about the Michael Nybergs or the John McManuses or the James Hollands. Those are the kind of guys that are always telling me, you're doing great work, keep up with, mm -hmm. keep up with what you're doing. And, you know, so kind of going back to that mentor idea, I, I hope that that's how I um, come up and I encourage younger girls or boys that are going into this field. Don't think about those people that are making fun of your accent or saying that your degree is useless because you, you studied in Poland, but you don't speak Polish. Find what, what you're good at and keep on doing it. Um, so that's, that's kind of really all I have to say, just to add on to what Joe had to say. I think that's such an important message to just say, could, if, you're, if you're passionate and you love what you're doing, you've got to keep going. Don't let anyone stop you because this is your dream and your life. It's not anyone else's. And I think that's a brilliant thing. Well, just, and also to, we're all about educating. I'm sorry, Olivia, didn't mean to interrupt you, but we're all here to teach these stories of World War II. And so we're only going to be better if we work together. Exactly. The teamwork and being united. It's, it's simple, really. I wanted to just quickly go on to this next question because I know Claire has to go soon and I wanted to hear her opinion on this. Um, I know a handful of you are mothers. Um, and this is something, you know, someone young in my career, and I'd love to know your opinions of it as I obviously come to that point in my life if I ever decide to become a mother. Um, I know this is something I had a university seminar with actually with a bunch of female historians, and they all talked about being a mother and the impact of being a mother in their career. And it was really interesting seeing one woman saying that her career had flourished and done really well because she wasn't a mother. And one saying that basically set her behind two to three years from choosing the path of motherhood and I'd be really interested for those of you who are uh, Claire if you don't mind starting you know has this impacted your career would you say it is impactful well, something that women we actually have to take and consider because we're the ones who have a child look after it we you know it's not like males who obviously paternity leave but it's a very different situation for us um do you know I have never been asked about this before uh, I am a mother, I have three daughters, um, they're getting on now, so am I, um, but I suppose for me, I mean there's been, it's, it's both helped my career and at times it has made things more, uh, I've had to juggle more things obviously, um, so I, I wouldn't have become a historical author had I not have had a child because I had, I was working as in the marketing department, I was a marketing person for an, an international development agency called Save the Children. And I came across the story of the founder of Save the Children while I worked there. And I just loved the fact that she was, um, she kind of broke so many stereotypes. For one, like for one, she hated children, never had any of her own, she was gay. Um, it's just fantastic woman, very inspiring, great story. And it's only because I went on maternity leave and I thought, well, I'll write a little article while I've got, you know, a couple of months. Um, and that article turned into a huge research project and seven years later I published my first book. So, you know, in some ways perhaps getting a career break, being forced to have a career break to some degree is good. And also, I mean, there's just positives as well of, you know, being forced to sometimes pause. I have had to stop to, to push the swings and I've had to stop to push the study, study short, the study door shut. And sometimes it's good because it gives you more time to reflect on things and sometimes it's really difficult. Um, but I think that sometimes men are juggling a lot of these things too and increasingly so these days and rightly so. So I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a purely gendered thing. Um, of course there are difficulties with, with juggling a career and being a mum but I don't think that they're I just think that every person, man or woman, needs to decide what is best for them and then pursue it 110%. And if you do that, then you can be a fantastic historian. You can be fantastic at anything else. You can be in the army. Um, these days, you can do just about anything. And we could do with more childcare support. We could do with all sorts of better things. But I think most people in most careers can find things that they could, they could find that could help them. So I don't think it should stop you. In some ways, it can be an advantage. Uh, there were times when I was juggling a baby and a papoose around my top in an archive where it wasn't an advantage. But, you know, it's always made a good anecdote to give it a talk. So, yeah. <laughs> And I think the fact is you're such an extremely successful historian now that really, in hindsight, has it impacted it much? No, I think, well, it, would, you, would you say so? Who knows? I mean, 
when I was trying to finish my first book, it was actually became a race between delivering my manuscript and delivering my first baby. And I have to say the baby won. Uh, <laughs> and it did get tricky at times, you know, breastfeeding while typing. That is quite, mm. you know, I got quite lopsided because I could only type with my right hand, couldn't swivel <laughs> around. You know, so <laughs> there are things to cope with, but maybe, you know, learning to cope with multiple things is not a bad mm. skill to have anyhow. No, de- definitely. It's all about balance, isn't it? And organisation. Um, Melissa- yeah, exactly. Melissa, I'd like to know your thoughts on this. Um, yeah, I I was very blessed to have a very well-behaved daughter. Um, from birth, she was just this great baby. And I decided to go to graduate school and she was two. And it was just the two of us because um, I moved um, west or east to go to graduate school. And I was really astonished at how supportive my department was. I, you know, if I didn't, I only had her in childcare while I was in class or if I had to go and do research or something. And I remember taking her with me to meetings with my advisor and she just sit there and, you know, be the good little kid that she was, she was three years old or whatever. And, and I just remember being so thankful that I had that support. And I even was able to bring her to um, my German reading course. You know, she sat there you know, with the rest of the class and, you know, just did her thing. Um, so I was very, very grateful for that. Um, and also one of the, the best things for me um, is that I got to, my daughter got to learn along with me. Um, she's 20 now and she loves World War II history. She has watched, you know, Band of Brothers series two or three times. Um, she reads books about the Holocaust. She took two courses in her um, high school class, one on Holocaust literature and one on um, just the history of the Holocaust. So we've kind of done this journey together. And that has been just, you know, a really wonderful thing for me. We went to, you know, um, in Colorado here, they have like a 1940s ball where they have, you know, all of you get dressed up as, you know, 1940s style and, and, you know, go and see everybody in their, the airplanes. And so it's just, we've been able to really bond over my career. And that has been one of the most rewarding things for me. And to have, to be able to inspire the next generation um, of historians and to also educate the next generation. So I was very, very fortunate to have wonderful support. And yes, there was, as Claire said, there's times when, you know, I had to run to school and pick her up or, you know, you always have to juggle something. But um, I, I, I don't think it hindered my career at all. I think it actually um, enhanced it because I had to, to, like Claire said, take time to say, okay, well, I have to put this aside because my child's, you know, homework that she needs help with is more important than me doing this particular research right now. But um, overall, I've just, you know, being a mother to me is, is, was, she was the best thing that ever happened to me. And we just been able to bond over our shared love of World War II history. Oh, that's so interesting. Before, I just want to move on to Jenny next, but before I do, um, Claire, if you've got, if you've got to leave, I just want to make sure we say goodbye to you and thank you for your contribution to this. If the time is good, I just want to double check. Or she might have already left. <laughs> if so, Jenny, <laughs> can you pick up and crack on, please? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to be the one that puts the downer on it again. And um, because I, I know that we, we stand by our choices, we make our choices, but I don't think until you have children, you really have a full appreciation of the word relentless. Um, and I think about all of the sort of acknowledgements in the history books I read, and it's to my darling wife, Emily, and the twins, Otto and Wenceslas, that I haven't seen for five years. And the reality is that practically the, the house needs cleaning and the meals need um, cooking and the school bag needs um, packing and the socks need finding in the morning and so forth and there is an element of um, actually being torn and for some people they respond very very positively um, I, I, I find it a struggle and rather stupidly I've decided to have a full-time job children and take on a part-time PhD so I'm, I'm clearly utterly mad and I'm also at the stage of going I'm gonna have to ask a huge amount from my husband in terms of there's a day I need to go to the library for example Covid has sort of shielded me from that reality. Um, So you do need that family support in in place. Um, Career wise, um, I I made the decision to go part time. 
um, which worked for the family. It doesn't work for a career necessarily. It's very hard to get career progression from that. So I'm essentially where I was nine years ago. Um, but, but that's kind of one of those choices that you make. Um, but what I would say is um, in terms of um, the impact on female academics, um, I think Richard Evans was, was um, created a tweet when he was talking about um, the number of papers um, that he traditionally um, received from men and women and what has actually happened to those ratios under lockdown. And you essentially have the sorry to be crass, the Boxing Day tsunami effect of the men racing ahead and the women actually holding the fort with the children. Um, so I think we're perhaps kidding ourselves to suggest that there are huge numbers of positives, as Melissa says, I mean, just sharing this passion uh, with my girls and going to the tank museums and, that, you know, there's just so many more opportunities um, and that just they, they love this and that's fantastic. Um, but it is a choice that you make and it's not necessarily a choice that you fully understand going into it. Um, apologies for crushing anybody's baby dreams here. But. Don't worry, Jenny, you just put me off for another 10 years. So it's Brilliant. Fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah, I know we spoke about this personally, and Jenny also obviously touched about some of the negative sides of being a mother, which I think is very valid, and we do need to look at. And I'm glad that we've actually had women talk about both sides of the story here, really. Um, so, Jenny, thank you for highlighting that. Like, it is very important for people to be aware of that it isn't all, you know, just happiness, really, is it being a mother to an extent? But Sarah, we talked about the social side, you know, being, you know, a historian and kind of like a mother as well. And I just want to know what you want to expand on with this. Well, and first of all, I think to be fair, I have to say and claim that I am a workaholic. Uh, I think that's part of my problem. Um, but when you're dealing with such a heavy topic like the Holocaust or just World War II in general, um, I feel like I personally can never turn it off. I, I go to work, I do my job, but there's always a new book coming out that I feel like I need to read. I need to learn more. Um, there's, there's this race against time. Our, our veterans are, are dying every day. The only Holocaust survivors that are left are children survivors, and we're losing them at a rapid rate. Um, you know, just recently there was this, this poll that came out about how so many Americans just don't know about the Holocaust. So I read things like that and I'm thinking, I am not doing enough. I've got to do more. I got to read another book. I need to watch this film. I've got to, to, to chat and communicate with people in this field. Um, and it's, it really does sometimes bog you down. And, it, and then just, of course, the, the topic of the Holocaust is depressing. Um, and so here I am, I'm 33, I'm still single. Uh, and my, my younger brother, he, not too long ago, he said, because you know, I'll go on dates and usually there's a first date, but not really a second date. And if there is a second date, there's never a third. And my brother goes, are you, are you talking about the Holocaust on your dates? And I was like, yeah thinking in my head, am I talking about the Holocaust? My brother's like, don't talk about the Holocaust. Do not talk about that. Don't talk about war on a date. But I don't know how to turn it off because I, again, I feel like I've just got this race against time and I've got to keep on pushing forward. Um, and so I do think that I've chosen my career more over um, becoming a, a wife and a mother. Um, I don't regret my choices by no means, but I do think that studying this um, and one time, Shane Taylor, who played Doc Rowe and Band of Brothers, we were in Clairvaux, and it was, we were late night having a cocktail after dinner, the group had all gone to bed, and we were talking about how there's just a sense of responsibility with, with, you know, him taking that role in Band of Brothers, and then me following my career path, it just never ends, um, and so that's, it, it's hard for me to turn it, turn it off. If it's your passion and it's something, your career and everything you're following, of course it's hard to turn off. I think we can all vouch for that, really. And I know we've all probably gone on and talked a bit about the war to someone who isn't that interested, but really, who cares? Embrace <laughs> it. It's what you're passionate about, that's what I think. Um, the next kind of topic I think is really interesting, and I know it's, I think we have all experienced this, um, and is mansplaining. Um, Lena, I'd love to know, and I know you've got a good topic here, well, a story about your experience of mansplaining. Um, to be honest, I, I haven't experienced any mansplaining. Very, 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 very rarely. Um, it's usually coming from women. 
women oh, are my biggest problem. Them, please. Yeah, women are usually the ones that criticize, uh, that find faults in things that you say and all sorts of things. I have had mainly most of my problems with women. Um, and great. to be honest, it's not the men, it's not the mansplaining. But I just, I wanted to throw an anecdote that I completely forgot to say earlier um, to do with accents. I know this is completely off topic, but no, when, a lot of, when a lot of people meet me, as you all very well know, I'm probably the most foreign named person on this panel, obviously Polish. So people walk up to me, and go, oh my God, wow. I heard you speak, I speak really good English. And then I look at them and I'm like, that's because I was born in Hackney, I was born in London, thank you. Uh, but I really appreciate your compliment. Uh, and I get it the opposite way as well, actually, because I speak Polish fluently and uh, a lot of Polish people are like, wow, you speak Polish really, really well. I'm like, yeah, that's because that's actually my first language. Um, but back onto the topic of uh, mansplaining and womansplaining, um, that's it, predominantly. Women are my biggest problem. What is it that you face with women? Like, what are the criticisms? So I think probably the best one I've <laughs> the best one I've had. Um, I was, of course, I'm always arguing on Facebook and Twitter with uh, Holocaust deniers and and all sorts because it's fun. It's fun to antagonise them. Um, and this one woman comes up to me. And she's like, um, "Well, I'm really sorry. Where where did you study?" I said, "Oh, I studied in in London." She said. I'm afraid I can't listen to anything you say. You didn't study at a Polish university. You've got no right to talk about Polish history. I'm like, hmm. Oh, okay. Polish uh, background, family. Uh, I speak the language fluently. Uh, I am assimilated into the culture. Sorry, you know, clearly I can't talk about Poles and Polish history. Thank you very much. How do they feel when you kind of come back with that? Because it's such, like you say, legitimate. Be like, seriously, look at look at me and look at my background. Like, how can someone say that to you? And they still carry on trying, so I laugh. And that <laughs> probably that really really pisses people off when I laugh. Definitely, because I think they know they're in the wrong. Yeah, and they've got exactly. nothing else to fight back with. Exactly. Oh, I think that's, that's brilliant. We'll keep up going with it. I think that's something we all need to take a tip out of. If someone's doing that, just to kind of laugh at them. So thank you, for Lena. Um, well, if no one else is, I'd like to kind of then move on to looking at like working in the media, as I know, Alina, yourself as a podcast host for The Wonderful History Hack and Stacey, your work within your film. Um, and it can be quite a male dominated industry. I noticed something that I experienced as I work in the TV industry. And I'd like to just kind of know both of your opinions. You know, have you found it quite male dominated or I mean, Alina, your experience already seems quite positive in terms of working with females. I know Alex and you have got such a great working relationship and it's great to see two strong females working and doing this in the history field. Uh, but has there been anything so far that's kind of come across your way? Male wise? No, uh, I actually, I actually rang Alex up when uh, you guys emailed the question flag and I said, I don't know what to say with this question because all our experiences have been completely and utterly positive. Where do we go with this? And there is, it is just completely utterly, you know, Roger Morehouse, Paul, um, so many different men have been so supportive. And like I've said before, our criticism, our history hat criticism comes from women. We have had women attack us who have never met us, never once spoken to us, uh, interacted with us and they go onto various social media platforms and just chat the most awful horrific things about us and it's not coming from men it's coming from women so unfortunately sorry ladies you're all very wonderful but our biggest criticisms are women and Alex and I to be fair we are like you said very strong personalities in both of us we have both tried to probably kill ourselves each other um, it hasn't been the easiest ride because obviously we've got our own opinions, but we still do work extremely well together. And I wouldn't want to have anybody else on my side apart from her. I think that's so lovely. And I think it's also really important, like we mentioned earlier on, we want to talk about the positives and the negatives. And it's, you know, to highlight the fact that just because we're women in the field, our enemies actually aren't men. They're women. And you know, we're going to touch upon this in a question later on. But I'm really glad you've brought that up, Alina, because it is so important. I think it's something a lot of females go through and we don't actually vocalise as much. So thank you. Um, Stacey, I'd love to know, like working in like the film industry, has this been something that you've encountered? Um, Sure. I've, I, although I've, the film industry is 
predominantly men. <laughs> um, but, you know, I guess I'm sort of used to that working, you know, having come from a software engineering background, which is also mostly men. Um, but, you know, I, I have to say that my experience was actually quite positive because I'm like, I was the boss, right? So it's like, I'm the producer, I'm the writer. So I'm going in um, and, and I hired the men. So, <laughs> so that one was actually okay. I mean, we shot um, for a week at Schofield Barracks, um, which was the first place attack on the Pearl Harbor attack. Um, uh, and, and we had to meet with, you know, the military and that room was mostly men, you know, but, you know, they were all very respectful. And um, so, yeah, it's. It, <laughs> yeah, again, but then that's brilliant, you know, the positive experiences as well. I think it's important to highlight. Um, Joe, I know you wanted to add into this as well. Yeah, I I am um, I do because I very much agree with Alina what she said. Um, so as well as being a historian, I guide on the battlefields and um, you know, you will get a variety of people who come on board who who join your coach and none of whom you know prior to them joining um so i've had quite a few experiences of uh um men who've come on board my coach and uh you know not questioned my historical knowledge but questioned that i'm a female on the battlefield but once i get that that's fine and once i deliver what i've got to deliver that's fine and they understand where I'm coming from but I've had a I've had equally um so difficult situations with women um and not from the perspective that they know the history from the perspective that they haven't liked that I'm a female um and that I um we we call them in the industry battlefield groupies um, uh, and it's almost sort of like a jealousy, I suppose, if for want of a better fear world, that I want of a better, better word, that I'm a military historian, that I'm a battlefield guide, and that I'm a female, uh, possibly doing a job that they would want to do. So I've had quite a few times, not quite a few, couple of times, I should say, uh, that I've been undermined by women who have been passengers. Um, when I've been working on the battlefield. And I think you need to take the moral high ground. You need to, uh, my, always when I'm guiding my, um, uh, the way I, the way I deal with it is to be quite quiet, uh, deliver the best that I can possibly deliver on the, on the uh, military history section or, 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 on the battlefield and generally if you're a guide um a coach group will police themselves so if they, if they see there is somebody that is trying to you know heckle you make life difficult be that male or female very very often they will uh police a coach for you so you, you don't need to say a huge amount if you deliver the best you possibly can the coach group who you're working with will very soon sort out, let's say, the men from the boys and 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 will come on board to your side in that they they understand that you're being um oh how can I put it heckled or 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 there's somebody that's trying to make your life difficult. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not been from the uh uh the male side, it's also been from the female side as well. So I've had it from both sides. I, get, I think that's still so important to highlight, you know, that it's not just colleagues, it's people on your tours as well. It's very <laughs> interesting, Jo. Uh, Lena, do you have something else you want to input? Yeah, I just realised I was completely negative. <laughs> and I kind of want to revert that back and dial it back a little bit because actually in my field, my, my actual field of working, um, see people think I'm a Holocaust historian, I, I prefer to scale it back and say I work in concentration camps because I predominantly deal with Poles, but in that field of where talking to other Holocaust historians or concentration camp historians, whatever, 
and the women are just absolutely phenomenal. We're going to be interviewing um, uh, one of our guests uh, in a couple of days, actually. And we just created this amazing bond between us because we've got this common ground and we've spent so much time on the phone just chatting away like oh my god did you see this and then she finds some materials and she sends she sends them to me and vice versa and it happens with women in i don't know what it's like in other parts of world war ii fields because obviously i'm not in them but in this very specific one i seem to bond really strongly with women in my field but again like i said before the criticism comes from women on the outside so that was just the one thing I wanted to add. No, I think that's a lovely positive note. And it's so nice that you've got those bonds within your field as well. It's brilliant. Um, Sarah, before we kind of get into our concluding thoughts, I'd love to know about your experience of working within like museums and the museum industry, and especially in the US. So you know, I know you've got some interesting t- stuff to talk about here. Well, um, you know, when I went back to grad school, people, the question I always got was, um, oh, you want to teach? And I said, No, not at all, you know, and then it would be, well, you want to get your PhD, you want to be published, you want to write a book, and again, no, that wasn't, wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to continue working at the National World War II Museum. Uh, I wanted to be able to teach and educate in a non-conventional way, which by able to to do these World War II tours, I'm, I'm getting to really live out my dream and what I wanted to do. Uh, The museum has allowed me to um, be creative and coming up with new tours, um, but also meeting just the most brilliant and wonderful people in this field. And but not just my colleagues, uh, the people that travel with me. I love our guests and I love being able to talk to them, hear their stories, their World War II connection. And I I learned so much from them. Uh, And and, you know, working in the museum, um, I, I probably would have a little bit more freedom if I did do battlefield guiding or if I did write a book, um, you know, but I love where I am and I love seeing school groups come in and uh, just kind of seeing that light bulb go off. Uh, so right, one thing I really want to do is also encourage people uh, wherever you are, find a museum that's nearby that's open right now things are weird and tough right now, but if you can go support your local museum, um, this is a great time to do it. Um, For me, growing up in a small town, uh, I grew up right down the road from the Chenault Museum. And Nell Calloway, she's done such a great job uh, of the Chenault Museum in Monroe. And uh, I I go home all the time and I tell people, oh, you gotta go, you have gotta go see the Chenault Museum, it's amazing and people don't even know about it. Uh, I get all the time that people didn't know that there was a National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, So sometimes it is going to take a comic book or or sometimes even a really crappy World War II movie um, or, or a trip to the museum. That's going to be what encourages people to learn more, uh, to be educated and to maybe pursue that career in history. Uh, so I have wonderful experiences in both working at the museum here, but also working for the museum abroad. And I'm just so thankful for uh, being ha- having this opportunity. Oh, so I do, Sarah, I'd love to be able to bump into you on the battlefields at one point in the future. So I'll be keeping my eye out for you. Yes, enthusiasm is then we'll have a, have a glass of wine at the end of the day and talk about it all. It's great. Oh, that would be fantastic. I know Paul will host us at his house. Yes. Um, Sarah, I'd love to hear, um, sorry, Sarah, Stacey, I know you said about, talk about Pearl Harbor in this instance of working with the museums too. Yeah, so uh, it's a national park, the Pearl Harbor historic site. Um, and so I've done a number of uh, comic book signings with, and I would bring the veterans with me. And it's really, uh, that's been one of the most rewarding things to do actually, to meet people from all over the world and talk with them and tell them about these veterans and have them meet the veterans. Um, something that they wouldn't have done, you know, normally. So that's just a very uh, rewarding thing. Definitely. Has there been any difference between people's perspectives of, say, turning up and having a negative view, say, on the Japanese or something? And obviously it's very important for you and what you've looked at to change that mindset and the education as well. Have you found that very right. possible at times or, you know, an important step in educating? <laughs> Maybe not a... Uh, a I guess the, the challenge is really that people don't know that they exist at all, you know? And so that's, that's the challenge. Um, and so that's, that's how I'm bringing it to the forefront, you know, and shine a spotlight on it because there are, 
there are actually a lot of books and documentaries about them, um, but there aren't too many people who will pick up a fat history book, you know, because it's sad, you know, it's sad and it'll take them a long time, but they can pick up a comic book that'll take them 15 minutes to read and learn a whole lot of stuff. So um, that I want to say that, you know, I'm, I'm just really grateful that we have um, such a supportive and wonderful crew at the Arizona Memorial gift shop, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That you're surrounded by a great, like a good supportive crew, as you said. Um, I think I'd love to just kind of finish up on this last question now. And we've talked a lot of positive experiences tonight. And I think we'd, I'd love to leave this on a positive note. Um, really, everyone, I know we've all had moments in our career that I guess we can look on and talk about negatively. But to finish, I'd love to hear some of those like defining positive moments that you've all had, whether it's working with females, whether it's working with males, or just standout moment being a Second World War historian. I'd love to know. So Jenny, could you kick us off if you have one? Um, yeah, I mean, this is an academic, academic, um, but one of the nicest things is when I'm posting um, photographs or, or stories about the, the Polish presence in Britain is the number of comments I get who, from um, British people whose, whose um, parents came through Siberia uh, or, or fought in Matic Division. Um, and just to have that, that acknowledged um, openly and discussed because it's something that, as I say, the Polish community sort of kept within itself and it's really not been shared, you know, um, for a whole host of reasons. So, yeah, the, the fact that, it, you know, sort of giving somebody an element of their family history back and pride in that is, is really, really positive for me at the moment. Oh, that's lovely. Melissa? I had, um, last year, I was giving a talk at a local museum and mm -hmm. when I finished, um, this young girl about 12 came up to me and she had a copy of my book and she wanted me to sign it. And she said, I want to be a historian when I grow up. And that was for me just a really wonderful moment to know that, you know, here's another female. And I, I told her, I said, you keep studying because we need more female historians out there. So that that was probably one of the best moments of my career so far. Oh, that's lovely. Jo? Um, yeah, I would echo that, actually. Um, uh, being a battlefield guide, um, I had a schoolgirl who came up to me and said, I would want, I want to do what you do as a um, battlefield guide. And, and, and the pinnacle of my career would be seeing another young girl, young woman, go out onto the battlefield and said and saying that actually I want to do I, I've done this because I was inspired by a military historian Joe Hook the other thing is um, taking the veterans out that has been a huge privilege for me um, and also the feedback I get I work for a lot of different battlefield tour companies and I only get work um, because of the feedback I get. And, and the feedback I get has predominantly been um, excellent. So that's how I get repeat business. And, and that for me has been, you know, the amount of letters, um, you know, emails, friends I've made, friends I've made on the battlefield who've been passengers who are now great friends um, has been, all of those have been my standout moments, I think. Oh, Joe, that's so lovely. I have to admit the history community is great. I mean, over the last year, I've definitely made some very close friends through just simply Twitter or other means. And it is a wonderful connection, just what we're involved in, isn't it? Mm. Uh, Sarah? I, it's kind of hard to just choose one, so I'm going to choose two very quickly. The first is obviously just kind of what Joe just said, getting to travel with the World War II veterans um, and also the Holocaust survivors that I've had the opportunity to meet and listen to their stories, especially um, Hannah Corral, who I said at the beginning just changed the course of my life. Um, being being able to travel with those people and hear their stories firsthand, there's, there's nothing like it. However, um, going back to just the National World War II Museum doing these international tours and me getting to go on them, uh, the people that I've met, the guests, and the stories that they've told me and, and seeing and, and 
you know, they're following in the footsteps. Most of them are, are boomers. And so they're following their dad's steps or their uncle's footsteps, or maybe even their grandfather's, or maybe there isn't a World War II connection. But they're just really interested in this. And there's something so, so special of going with these people to places like Omaha or, or Braycourt Manor or, uh, uh, you know, the Ardennes uh, or down going into, we're doing tours more throughout Poland and, um, and Germany. And it's just so incredible to know that I am, like I said, Hannah changed the course of my life. I am being a part of something great that's changing other people's lives. And that's probably been the most defining moment. Um, it's not really a moment, it's continual. It's this doing these tours, but it's, it's really special going to these places with the people that I have. That's lovely. Um, and last but not least, Stacey. Oh, well, there. <laughs> so there are a few moments. Um, and actually, it was probably not when the comic book was done, but it was in the process. So uh, my artist would send me pages and then, you know, so it's, it's historically accurate. And so something, you know, if it's in the comic book, it happened to a real person. And, you know, sometimes they were still alive. So I would show it to them and I'd be like, look, this is you. This is your story. And just their reaction, you know, it, it was just very uh, gratifying. Um, and, and the second thing was actually being in Bruyere and Bifontaine in France in the Vosges Mountains in 2014 for the 70th anniversary of the liberation. Um, they are, the 10442 is so celebrated there. You know, they're much more appreciated um, there than they are in America, which is sort of sad. But, you know, understandable, right, because they liberated them from the Nazis. And they, um, and so they had, there was a book signing. We, we had three veterans with us on that trip. And the original foxholes are still there. And the unit is still active in Hawaii. So they did the honor guard and there was a parade. Um, and they do this every year, but not, you know, not with veterans every year. Um, but there was this um, book signing at City Hall that they had set up for me and the veterans. And we were just... Uh, we were just mobbed, you know, and these, these are French people and they don't, they don't even read English. Um, but to me, that was just so, so wonderful, you know, to see how these men are celebrated and appreciated and for them to see it, you know, that's, that's what I, that was a definite highlight. Oh, that's lovely. I have to admit, I got that completely wrong. It, Stacey wasn't last but least. Alina is our last and he's going to end on, I hope, something really positive and great to finish this up on. Uh, I've got two positive ones. I'll start with a really soppy, soppy, soppy one first. So I, did a couple of, uh, I did a couple of school tours um, a, couple, a little bit while back. And when I finished a couple of months, actually six months later, the teacher contacted me and said, listen, two boys decided to go and follow history at university because of you. Oh, that's and yeah, I kind of cried a little bit. Let's, let's we'll do the soppy one first. So the second one is I can't exactly reveal exactly what this is. So because COVID has messed everything up as it has for everybody else. So I managed to pass something that even professional historians much, much more experienced than I have. Um, hopefully it will become all official in the new year. So do watch my Twitter space. Exclusive you will all find everyone. out yeah you will all find out what it is it is the most challenging thing it was worse than my master's and both my BA degrees put together but I passed it and I beat a lot of historians so there we go and then last Bravo. of all we cannot miss Paul you are the highlight of my life <laughs> quote well quote on quote <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming because I, I beg, I, I like, a, like I begged for compliments just a minute ago on the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I'm, I need, I need all the compliments I can get at my age. No, it, this, uh, well, this has been absolutely fascinating. It, it's done everything I wanted it to do and more. I can safely say it has been the most successful, most watched, non battlefield stream I've done. So of, of the kind of interview ones, it's the most popular one I've done so far. So that's something. Uh, that's probably because I wasn't talking. I'm that, that now. That's maybe it. Maybe maybe I'm the weak link. Maybe I should be on it less and let you people be on it. No, but anyway, it's been amazing stuff, and I think it can open the door to, to going down some very specific paths 
from this in future shows, either on History Hack or here or, or Olivia's um, podcast she's got coming up. I think there's other avenues we can go do. I think we could even ask men about working with women as opposed to asking women about working. Ask the men how, what, they, what, they, what we could be doing more to make it a, a, a better environment as well. Because I look at myself and think, what can I do? What, what? And part of that's coming from my stepdaughters who are pushing me more and more to being a radical young feminist, even though I'm a 51 year old balding white male, I'm becoming a, a strangely weird young French feminist female. But anyway, that I'm rabbiting, <laughs> rabbiting now. But anyway, it's been a fantastic, fantastic show. Uh, Olivia, you've done a f- great job. Um, Joe, Melissa, Claire, who's gone, Jenny, Sarah, Alina, you've all been fantastic. And uh, there's not, not been any particular questions coming in, or, or rather they have, but they've kind of been answered by Jenny as she's been going along and you've asked it during the course of the show. So um, I think the fact there aren't too many questions is because we've done a pretty good job. Well, when I say we, uh, you have done a pretty good job at, at, at discussing it all. So yeah, it clearly is a subject that is, 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 needs more discussion. And I like the fact we ended on very positives there. I think that was, that was absolutely the, the way to, to bring it to an end. And uh, I, I've had my trials and tribulations in my career, but, but the highlights so outweigh the, the, the very few low spots. And that's the thing to always think about. It's just, you know, it's been absolutely. a great Yep. So anyway, those of you I've met, I, I, I can't wait to see you again. Those I haven't met in person yet. I can't wait to actually meet you in person, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll put the spotlight on me for a second now just to finish things off. So thank you. Really, absolutely been fantastic. Um, in terms of housekeeping for the shows, I've got um, uh, an interview with Eric Lee about Night of the Bayonet on Thursday evening. I'm working on some Gold Beach stuff for next weekend with Peter Caddick Adams. Lots more shows coming up. Damien Lewis is is kind of premiering his new SAS Band of Brothers book on my show later in the month. Um, if you have enjoyed this, please share the link. The YouTube, the, the, the film will stay there on YouTube indefinitely or forever. So copy this link share it around get people get discussions going what what subjects could we have discovered discussed more how can we go on from this i think it's very much a, a, a beginning of a project not a conclusion i think this is opening the doors to more of these conversations and getting more people involved and i'm absolutely stripped in my world war ii tv that i bring the best people on whether be they academic be they non-academic be they male female young old if you've if you know what you're talking about I will use you. And I know a leader and Alex have the same policy on history hack. You could, if you know your subject, you know your subject. So anyway, thank you very much. I'll put it back on the gallery view again. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, it's been a privilege listening to you. And, um, and anyone anyway, got any final comments they want to say? No, just thank, thank you, you Paul. Yeah, thank you to you. No, it's no, no thank you for yeah. being for the being the, the consummate guest. So anyway, well, thank you very much. I'm going to end the stream now. You can find out about all these wonderful historians uh, in the links in the description below. There, most of them are uh, busy on uh, social media, Twitter and Facebook and what have you. And and um, and go and watch, go and download Stacey's brilliant Go for Broke film because uh, I watched it again last week and it's really good. Buy Claire's books. Get. Jenny's tweet tweets, uh, listen to Alina's podcast, buy Melissa's books, listen to Olivia's podcast, go on Sarah's tours, and I think I've covered everybody. That's it. No, yes. not me. No, 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 no. <laughs> go on Joe's tours uh, and and go and learn about Market Garden and, and and have Joe tell you about how she had all these parachute regiment veterans tell it, you know. I would not. I, I wouldn't have wanted to go and take out parachute vet, regiment veterans to Arnhem, let alone doing it as a female. I wouldn't want to do that. So well done. You weren't your spurs. So thank you very much, everybody watching. I'm going to end the stream now. So it's been Paul Woodard and this wonderful team of historians. Thank you very much for a fascinating conversation. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.